Welcome to Supply Chain Briefs, the podcast that discusses the today's challenges, issues, and critical issues in today's global supply chains. I'm your host, Joseph Moretta, and thank you for joining us. On today's episode, we have Melissa Freeland, who's here to tell us about uh, digital transformation. Uh, Melissa has many, many years of experience, so we're really excited to have her on a very special edition of Supply Chain Briefs, which is a live uh, podcast that we're doing right now. Uh, welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here tonight. Yeah. So um, let's get things rolling. I just, uh, we'll kick things off um, and we'll jump right into this uh, exciting conversation. So, Melissa, first and uh, firmo, uh, first and foremost, um, what exactly is digital transformation? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Joe. Someone recently uh, asked me the very same question. Um, Digital transformation essentially is really the adoption of digital technologies to create or improve your business. Whether you're a small company or a large enterprise, each organization is different with different and unique challenges. Um, It's about how you need to manage your business that will inform your transformation roadmap. It's about building and improving your e-commerce, or it could be building and improving upon your software tools and KPIs. It could be improving your processes, your procedures, your best business practices. It's really a journey, if you will. That's great. Um, thank you so much for that. I uh, really appreciate that. So, Melissa, I was hoping that you could just give us a little overview and a little uh, more information regarding digital transformation. Yes, exactly. And before I do that, um, I'm going to actually jump into a personal story of mine. I like to try to kind of uh, combine things that go on in my day to day personal life with a little bit of things um, that we deal with in our work environment. And so um, I had about a year ago now, um, I had I have a, a 20 year old colleague of mine that I worked with several years ago who was experiencing some heart troubles. Um, It was causing him some fever and some pain. He ended up going to the emergency room. Uh, He it found out that he had actually an infection around his heart. Um, He was he was given prescriptions um, and told you know take these uh, take these pills for the for the next two weeks. Uh, He went to his primary care physician. Um, who, you know, basically instructed him to continue to rest and, you know, long term, you need to lose about, you know, 20 to 30 pounds um, and also improve your eating habits. He began walking about three times a week. He started out about, you know, uh, one mile, got up to three miles, was very excited about it, Uh, became kind of a personal challenge, a personal goal for him, if you will. Uh, He ended up purchasing himself, you know, a smartwatch and iWatch, actually, to be exact. (laughs) Uh, his physician advised him to continue monitoring your heart rate. Don't be too quick about everything. Don't jump in too fast. Um, and one day during a walk, he was actually feeling a little bit sluggish and noticed that his heart rate had actually suddenly spiked. He felt a little off. So he went home, ended up going to the emergency room again. It turned out to be okay. He actually had to rest again for another several weeks, but he was told he needed to slow down. So now the iWatch certainly didn't cause him to lose weight. It didn't really save his life, but it did help to guide him um, by providing the real-time data, allowing him to make a quicker decision in that moment, potentially smarter decisions. So why am I telling this story? Well, and again, as I mentioned before, we all get caught up in our day-to-day activities. We get up in the morning, we get ready, we get our kids up, we get them ready, we drop them off, we go to work, whether we're physically in the office or we're at home. Uh, virtually meetings, again, in person or virtual, we forget about all the technology that's around us because we're so used to it in our personal lives. And when we think technology, we tend to think more about um, how it applies to our personal lives. What new smartphone am I going to get? What home security system do I want? What printer do I want? What about technology in the workplace? How can we work to transform the success of our business using technology out there? That's really interesting. And I, I really appreciated that story too, because that story kind of leads us into this discussion. I think that gives us a great opportunity to segue into uh, this presentation. So Melissa, I was hoping you could explain to me why would a company want to implement new technologies in the face of everything that's happening in the world? Because the world is changing constantly. So I was hoping you could touch a little bit about the, on that. 
Yeah, um, it's really important for companies to get out there and really understand what kind of technology can help them just improve their overall business. It helps them to stay relevant. It helps them to stay competitive. You have to get ahead in the game. It reducing mm-hmm. risks, costs, reducing stress to the organization, and keeping up with that changing customer demand. And speaking of demand, Let's talk about what's going on in the world today, what you were just talking about, Joe. Sure. There's a global crisis going on, right? Everybody knows that there's a global pandemic. There's natural disasters happening, hurricanes, flooding, wildfires. There's political unrest abroad, and sometimes at home these days, too. And what is it causing? It's causing a great amount of demand volatility, which is also causing inventory excesses and shortages. There's something also, a term that I've I've, uh, kind of seen kind of passing around lately called the great resignation, where because of the pandemic, folks are really changing their priorities and they're Mm -hmm. baking that together with a lack of the desire to commit. So companies really need to stay on top of the demand volatility that's happening right now. Wow, that's really interesting actually, because I think you touched on something uh, extremely significant and that's basically the need to stay relevant. So uh, staying on that topic, um, what are some options for organizations when it comes to staying current on technological advances? Yeah, there's a couple of options out there. Um, There's something called IoT, which we'll get into for a few minutes. And for those of you who don't know what that means, what is it? It's called, it means the internet of things, essentially. Mm. And IoT is really wireless connections that transmit data between physical objects. So it's with the usage of software, it, you have the ability to collect, process, exchange data between objects or devices, uh, such as you know home security systems or even smartwatches that we were talking about a few minutes ago, where it's sending data from that, uh, the, the, the watch or the phone to an app. Um, organizations really have the ability to take advantage of this technology so that they can improve their business. Wow, that's, yeah. So I, I definitely see how these interconnected devices are definitely leading this data and this and these transformations that's going on. Um, what options do organizations have to implement this IoT technology? Yeah, there's several options out there. There's a plethora of uh, companies out there that have a lot of different kinds of offerings. Some of which, you know, you've got RFID technology, which basically combines mobile smart devices using chips and sensors that are embedded in objects and even living things. Um, It measures data, gives you kind of location, temperature, movement, and even speed uh, of whatever it is that you're tracking. There's also um, something that I I learned recently, um, smart farming or um, terminology, basically internet of living things, which I thought was really fun. Um, Basically sensors measuring the health of the animals, temperature conditions in the barns, gauging uh, crop health uh, by measuring the soil conditions, combining weather data for further analytics. Um, There's also something called industrial IoT, which basically connects all of your assets within the manufacturing sites. So you're talking about connecting port flips and delivery trucks and like sorting machines and HVAC systems. Um, It really gives you the ability to measure your usage when parts need to be replaced, et cetera. Um, and then there's also logistics. There's a new technology out there that allows on-site shipping container tracking plat- platform capabilities. Basically, again, embedding sensors for location tracking allows the connectivity to applications via uh, mobile smart devices. And it feeds into a data platform, providing up-to-date info and analytics within an application. Wow. So it really seems that IoT has a plethora of applications. That's all good and dandy, but what are some of the benefits that companies could see by implementing this kind of a technology? How are they gonna utilize this? How are they going to improve? What, what What are some of these benefits? Yeah, some of the benefits that these companies are seeing, and if you can imagine, it's sort of like each silo within that chain of events is connected. So IoT really allows for real-time information exchange. Uh, It allows the receiver to obtain information faster, Uh, more sophisticated analytics, uh, maybe quicker decisions, more informed decisions and predictions and forecasting. 
uh, more for more favorable outcomes. And it really allows you to determine alternative plans if necessary. Uh, it's very beneficial for a lot of companies who have seen a lot of uh, benefits from this. Wow. So definitely uh, a lot of opportunities there, but um, I was wondering if you could touch on just a little bit of how would that play into, uh, let's say, an organization's growth? Like, how does that actually promote the growth? How does that foster the growth? Uh, I was wondering if you could touch on that a little. Yeah, and actually, um, there's something uh, else called um, artificial intelligence, which also plays into the growth of the company. Um, mm -hmm. It allows for the automation of standard operations. Um, using sort of under the surface algorithm driven tools, uh, provides for quicker data driven results. Again, um, assurance of zero human error, more insights into patterns via robust metrics and KPIs. Um, and really you're, it allows the companies to kind of take that information and redirect human resources to tasks where humans are really necessary to assist with. Wow. So this would really enable an organization to really expand and accelerate and, and exponentially accelerate their growth. Um, that's kind of uh, something that I, hadn't, I didn't really didn't think of how that would play into uh, all this. Um, so we talked about kind of like what AI is, what how to implement it and all that. I was wondering, um, how, how can other organizations decide to implement AI? What are those steps look like? What are those strategies of like? Yeah, that's a great question, Joe. There are different ways that organizations can look to implement AI um, and even IoT, um, ranging from, you know, high-end data uh, mining and analytics to automated customer service and even uh, towards optimizing logistics uh, using tracking, tracking and managing their assets. Um, first, you need to identify the problems that you need to solve. I'm sure that all of us on the call here could probably think of three to five issues within our companies um, that, you know, and then prioritize which is most valuable to the bottom line of your business and then go after it. Uh, you need to familiarize yourself with the options that are out there. Like I said before, there are so many options out there, so many companies getting on the bandwagon with uh, regards to digital technology options. You really need to go out there and do your homework. Once you identify that one problem that you want to solve, you have to go out there and do your homework so that you can really understand which, um, which company would benefit you the most. Um, make sure that you acknowledge your internal capabilities. Can you do it with your current resources or do you require extra, uh, ex external assistance? You need to assess your current talent to see if you're able to do it on your own. Make sure that you form a task force create a timeline, create goals within your timeline, uh, hold check-ins, make sure that you hold everyone accountable. Everyone should have a task to take part in this implementation and start small and then build up from there. There's no reason why you have to you know, start large. If you've identified you know, five different opportunities that your company has, there's no reason to go after all five at the same time, especially if you're a smaller organization and you don't have as right. much talent on hand. So maybe pick that one, like I said, that means the most to the bottom line of your business and right. go after it. Right. And you raise an interesting point there, uh, um, I, something I wasn't thinking about. But if a company was looking to implement, you know, AI or IoT, um, there's going to be some potential barriers to the yeah. organization. Mm -hmm. um, can, could, can you touch on a little bit of that? Yeah, um, you know, recent surveys actually suggest um, that there are some barriers, uh, you know, for implementing uh, new digital technologies. You know, um, the recent pandemic uh, that, we've, that we've been experiencing for the last year and a half now, it feels like, um, has really unpeeled away a lot of challenges that organizations are having um, internally uh, that, that there, where there are opportunities to kind of uh, improve upon. And so some of the, the challenges with regards to implementing some of these digital capabilities are really managing the unpredictable demand. That's probably the top number one uh, challenge or barrier that, that companies out there are really experiencing. It is the largest motivator for change, but is the biggest struggle for companies. 
According to a recent survey, there's only about 33% of technology investment um, is in demand planning and forecasting tools. That's not very much, so it kind of makes you wonder, how, are the, how is the other percentage getting along? How are the other two thirds getting along? And then the second largest barrier is really um, the ability to increase their automations. Um, organizations here have a lot of opportunity to apply AI. 40% of companies indicated that AI is not being pursued. There is a wide opportunity to implement planning automation, everything from you know, developing your machine learning, advanced simulations, forecast accuracy implementation, demand sensing. So um, you know, there are some barriers out there. Um, you know, um, and, and I think companies just need to collectively get together, work together and find solutions for them. Yeah, and you know, I always think, I think of like a challenge or a barrier or some kind of obstacle and I, I think of it and you can see it as a challenge or an, or an obstacle or something that's deterring you or on the other side of the coin, you can look at it as a great opportunity. And I think that, that a lot of companies have great opportunities when it comes to these barriers because it gives them that opportunity to innovate kind of restructure themselves and almost reinvent themselves mm -hmm. and yeah. melissa you know we in in prepping for this uh one thing that you had shared with me was one of the your favorite questions that you like to ask others and that is what keeps you up at night so i wanted to flip the script a little script a little here <laughs> and i wanted to ask you the same question what keeps you up at night yeah that's a great question fair enough joe fair enough <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it is my favorite question to ask. Um, and with regards to the topic tonight, um, you know, I mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the pandemic really exposed the weakest elements within our businesses. Um, and, you know, based off of the research and some of the, the, the surveys and the data that, you know, out there, I'm concerned that only the strongest who are willing to invest in these technologies are actually going to survive and come out on the upside. Um, you know, organizations are struggling with managing that unpredictable demand. It's so volatile right now. Mm -hmm. um, funding capabilities to increase that, that automation. Um, you can acknowledge, but if you don't address it, I worry that there are companies out there that aren't going to come out on the other side. One final call out from uh, this recent survey was that 50% of companies survey, participating in the survey, indicated that they were currently somewhere in between seeing the benefits of um, and gaining approvals to accelerate uh, their digital implementation efforts. And of those 50%, those who were in that mix came from companies that make you know, billions of dollars annually. The other 50% were either not pursuing or we're just in the exploration phase. And those challenges were either lack of data, lack of, um, lack of investment, um, and even skill set, internal skill sets. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, with that, um, another uh, note of importance uh, that I'd like to kind of bring up is just making sure that we're all staying relevant in supply chain. Um, education, networking is huge. Um, we need to make sure that we're networking, we're talking, we're getting together, we're working together to solve the issues. Um, I think it's very important for us, especially in this environment today, uh, given all of the challenges that we're experiencing. Yeah, um, and that's interesting um, that you mentioned that, you know, there's all this opportunity that's left on the table for companies to kind of innovate, grow, and expand. And it you know, it really, people who say that if you resist innovation, it really is the beginning of the death of a company. Yeah. Um, yeah. So failure to innovate, I mean, that's just um, one of those things that companies are going to have to look at and make a decision um, on that. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Melissa, I just want to say, ask you if you had any closing remarks for anybody that's listening right now, any recommendations or any last thoughts? Um, I think my last thoughts are, you know, really, I think that folks just need to really take a look inside and uh, be very open and very honest and very transparent with uh, what's going on in the organization. 
I think that folks need to um, really look to see where their current internal um, challenges are within the organization. What's the one thing, if you can't identify you know, three to five, what's that one thing that you can see that you believe if a company were to just make an investment um, you know, that you believe that can improve your business going forward, especially again with the, the state of the environment that we're in, what is it? And, you know, uh, be very transparent about it. Ask questions, ask questions. Um, and, and I think bringing it to light, I, I think just talking about it and asking questions, um, people just need to make sure that they're, they're being very transparent and addressing the challenges. Wow. That's, I mean, it, folks, if you're not taking anything away, you got to ask those questions. You got to make sure that you're understanding what's going on in your organizations and kind of identifying those pain points as Melissa was uh, uh, hinting towards. So I, I do want to thank everybody uh, for, for tuning in for our first ever live episode of Supply Chain Briefs. And at this time, I think I'm going to hand it over to uh, Bernita. Is Bernita still on the call? Yeah, yeah, she's here. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I, I'm here. Uh, so I'm looking through and seeing what questions we have. Uh, lots of excitement about this presentation. We got a lot of good um, feedback as far as that goes. Um, and then, well, it doesn't look like we have any specific questions. Um, does anybody want to turn off their mic and ask a specific question to our, our guest speaker? Melissa, I'll give you a moment. Just so you know, a whole bunch of Radians people are on a call right now. Melissa, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question for you. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, you were mentioning a little bit of the data, you know, 50% of those companies. Yeah. It always seems to happen that you know, companies that are strong somehow get stronger because they do have the capacity in dollars and cents, first of all, mm -hmm. uh, and the depth of knowledge to keep trying new things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where do you see this, you know, where the trickle down effect, if you will, will happen, where companies that are struggling today will be able to see some of those tools of the trade, if you will, uh, maybe in a year, maybe two years, so that they can you know, understand it better. In other words, you know, everybody talks of AI and blockchain and mm -hmm. machine learning, right? Yeah. But these are foreign words for 90% of the companies. And 90% of the companies who make up the smaller economy, you know, yeah. aggregate basis, but collectively they make a whole lot of business in the country, right? That, uh, that's just right, they do. So at what point do you think that this, this you know, sort of this trickle down uh, business uh, transformation would occur in the industry? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the large companies, you know, um, for example, if I could use the Amazons of the world, right? Um, there's certainly, um, you know, even the Googles of the world, uh, they're certainly um, making um, headlines, obviously, every day uh, with different things that they're working on. And I think that, um, you know, I think that learning from them, but I also just thinking, you know, it, it's really important that we network uh, with folks around the globe. We need to talk about the problems that we're having and we need to figure out how we're solving them. You know, um, smaller companies, which make up, like you said, uh, Sudhir, the majority of, frankly, the companies, at least in the United States, um, they need to really take a look and figure out what their challenges are. Again, that number one challenge um, and, and really just take a look at the Amazons and the Googles of the world and try to understand what are they doing that's making them so successful? Would it work for my organization? Yes or no, maybe not. Um, it really, uh, I think, depends on what type of product that you have. Um, and I think just it, folks just re need to really look internally and decide whether or not, you know, what's important to invest in now? What's the service levels that you wanna provide for your customers? Um, you know, if you want to increase service levels, you know, you've got to make some investments, you've got to spend money to make money. And so I think companies just really need to look internally um, and just take their time and, and take a look at the options that are out there. Uh, is it a sh application that you think you could be working with in your own company or maybe a work at a prior job that 
could have made life easier if you had this knowledge or maybe you're applying something now so everybody can understand it better? Uh, it, are you asking for like a particular application or just- Yeah, maybe, maybe an example, maybe in the past job or maybe in the current, you know, where you are, if an application can be taken down and brought into business. Um, I mean, in my prior life, um, we've used, yeah, we've used a, a, a significant amount of third-party software tools that assisted us with our demand and forecasting processes. Um, I think, you know, um, in my, in some of my more current roles, I think we're really struggling with kind of data mining, um, and just, you know, um, AI, if you will. Um, and I, I, I think that, that I, I think that there's probably a, some applications out there, um, that we need to take a look at. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I do have one question that comes from Dan Holmes. You said for demand planning, what resources and organizations do you recommend that we reach out to for digital transformation ideas? <laughs> Hi, Dan. Great question. Yeah. Um, in the past, uh, I've used uh, Legility Value Chain Solution software um, uh, for demand uh, forecasting and inventory planning capabilities. Um, I like that. I like that software tool. Um, it allows the capability to kind of preset uh, certain uh, parameters, if you will, uh, depending on your product types uh, uh, in certain category levels. Um, also, uh, JD Edwards, which uh, we're currently using, um, is also another great tool uh, that's out there that's probably uh, one of the more popular ones uh, that we're currently working on right now. Um, and I think that, that that one is also a great tool, especially um, in the way for uh, manufacturing planning. I would recommend those too. That's great. Um, how do you think digital transformation can help us better manage supply chain logistics issues in the COVID era? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question too. Um, I, you know, I mentioned it during uh, our podcast or question and answer earlier with Joe. Um, you know, there's there's machine learning and there's technology and there's also the human component as well. Um, there's a lot of demand volatility in the market right now. Um, I mean, yesterday, you know, we saw a spike in one product. Tomorrow, you could see a complete dip and, um, you know, another product could be, you know, soaring through the roof. I think not only is it important to make sure that you've got some intelligent software tools uh, in the way of technology, I also think that people just need to get together and talk more. Um, you know, I know myself, um, you know, and my colleagues uh, where I'm currently at, um, you know, we're in meetings all day, right? We're talking about what's going on, what's changing, what happened last hour, let alone yesterday. It's completely different, you know, what just happened today versus what happened this morning. Um, making sure that you're communicating very closely with your counterparts um, across the organization. You've got to continue the conversation, talk to your sales folks who are in constant communication with your customers, get on the phone. Um, the last couple of years, and probably even more, more since the pandemic started, um, in my current role and also in my prior role, I've never been more involved in meetings directly with the customer than now. And it's not because the sales team, you know, doesn't want to, you know, be part of the conversation. It's just that there's so much happening uh, in the way of especially logistics tracking and just all the way back in the supply chain that it's vital that even, you know, all of the groups that are involved within the supply chain, everybody has to meet and talk and get together um, and just stay connected. Okay, great. Um, is, okay, this is from Gary Smith. He said, is digital transformation just for large companies? What about the small and medium-sized companies? No, it's not. It's absolutely not just for the larger companies. Yes, um, you know, again, you know, the Googles and the Amazons, they got the, they got the cash on hand you know, to, to, to do it. Um, but smaller companies, I think, just really need to take a look um, and understand where they want their investments to happen. What is the challenge that means the most to the bottom line of the company? And that one thing, again, um, you need to, to try to find it and address it. And it's not just for large companies, absolutely small to medium size, uh, you need to figure out a way as well. There are lots of options out there. Very good. Uh, do we have any other questions? Anybody that wants to go live with their question? We'll give you a second. Rita, I actually have a 
question uh, from Melissa. Um, okay. Go for it. One thing that I kept hearing throughout everything that we talked about was the importance and the, the, the real need for data. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to how important is it for companies to be accessing real-time data? What what can companies do with that data as opposed to, you know, data that came from last week or a report mm. from a month ago? Yeah. So I was hoping you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I almost feel like I'm, I'm like repeating myself a little bit, so I apologize. But but yeah, I think um, companies need to figure out a way data. I mean, first of all, you know, garbage in, garbage out. I mean, if, if you don't have good data, you're not going to get good results. You got to make sure your data is clean. And if it's not, you got to clean it up. And you have to have a task force of individuals to do that. Um, second, secondly, um, you have to find a way um, in this world, you know, to, to, to make sure you're getting the most relevant data quicker. There's so many options out there from companies um, that allow that. Gone are the days of, you know, what's today, Wednesday? Oh, I pulled a report from last Friday. You can't have that anymore. The demand is so volatile. If you're unable to pull real time data with information and be able to make decisions quicker and smarter, I'd be worried. <laughs> what a statement. Um, <laughs> do you have a specific example that you want to reference where you can talk to the change management implementation and results? And then well, there's another question to follow, but do you want to wait for that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you could ask. Could you ask the question again? Sorry. Okay. So, do you have a specific example that you want to reference where you can talk to the change management implementation and results? Mm -hmm. What were the challenges you had to overcome? Oh yeah, sure. Oh my goodness. Um, a couple of years ago, at a recent organization that I was in, we were implementing uh, some technology software, um, and uh, it was challenging for sure. Uh, but we had a we had a team of folks. I think what made it work was that we had a task force, an internal task force, and each of those individuals that were responsible that were uh, on that task force had a specific responsibility. Um, the company was uh, they were producing demand forecasts, but they weren't producing uh, inventory plans, so they weren't planning out their buy. They were buying in the moment, but they weren't planning them out into the future. And so they didn't understand what their inventory was going to look like out into the future. And so that was a high risk, right? Because you can't get together and really know or understand what your financial, what the financial state of your business is going to be if you're not doing that. Um, and so, yeah, I think some of the challenges, uh, well, the benefit was, um, you know, uh, the solution, the software was already chosen before I arrived at the company. Um, but, you know, I think... Um, some of the challenges were that as a team together, a few folks had some different ideas about, you know, how, uh, how to best design it for the, the, the best management of the business. But you had some very brilliant folks with a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience and a lot of background that came together. And we all made the final decisions, um, you know, based off of how we felt that solution software was going to be designed so that we could push the business forward. Um, you know, there were some bumps along the way. I think we had to push out the implementation a couple of times, and that's okay. It happens, nothing, no implementation ever goes without a hitch. Um, you know, and I think once we launched uh, the, the software tool, I mean, it was like, you know, day and night compared to, you know, what they were doing before and what we were doing afterwards. Um, we were really to able, we were really able to understand um, and uh, uh, not just our forecast a little bit better, but um, provide better data and analytics in the way of the predictability of the data, the forecast accuracy measurements, um, and also just how it affected our inventory going forward. So um, it's always a bumpy ride sometimes, but um, you know, in the end, it's for the betterment of the company and you have to find a way to have fun with it too. You have to be passionate about it. That's great. Um, so it, the questions, we're, we're getting a few more, so bear with me but sure. it's going so well that I don't want to interrupt it. Uh, we will be stopping um, at 6.50. I'll just let everyone know that. So keep an eye all on your watch. Um, but, but for the question portion, I want to give you plenty of time to ask your question. Do you think that COVID has forced us to adapt to digital transformation rather than traditional practices in supply chain? That's a great question. I do. I think that COVID has 
absolutely unpeeled a lot of the challenges in many organizations. Um, we've all heard there are some companies that unfortunately have closed and they're not in business anymore um, as a result because they couldn't survive for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, listen, we're in the middle of a global crisis that happens, what, every 100 years, every 200 years? This has not happened. And non, none of us growing up in our childhood ever imagined that we would ever experience something like this, right? Um, but we are. Um, and I think it's exposing those areas um, that we've, you know, the, the, the most challenging places of our organization. We've got to, again, we've got to find the most challenging and you've got to fix it. Great. Uh, the one thing that every, and this is coming back from Gary, um, the last question was from uh, Allie. Uh, this one is from Gary Smith again. The one thing that everyone lacks is time. How long should an organization budget to implement a digital transformation? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, I think it really depends on what it is you're looking to transform. Um, you know, are you looking to build a new e-commerce website? Or are you looking for just new reports, KPIs, and metrics? Um, are you looking to implement an entirely new demand planning and forecasting software tool? Um, I think it really depends um, on, on what it is. It's going to be a little bit different depending on um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the solution that, that you need. Um, I've had some implementations, oh geez, last about a year and a half. Uh, that was a large one. Uh, that was a new planning software altogether. And I've had other solutions implemented um, that lasted maybe, I think, about eight or nine months. And that was more for reporting and data analytics, data mining, things like that. So I think it depends. And I know that's not really you know, a definitive answer to your question, but I think you need to find that one challenge in your organization and talk to the folks at large um, and kind of determine you know, how long that's going to take. All right, great. And uh, Raina just asked me, and this is, this is a question um, that I can answer. It's where could we review this podcast again? Uh, Raina, we are, we're going to be putting this up on YouTube as the video itself. The pod, and there will also be a website link on our website, which is uh, ASCM, or yes, ASCM, actually. Let me need to, let me to give that address a little bit later on, so you'll be able to look for that. We also have um, we have a um, we have membership on Spotify, so you can find us on Spotify. Just look for Supply Chain Briefs, just like you see it, or look up Joe Moretta. And either way, you'll be able to find us and follow us. We also have on the bottom of our website um, there is a link. Uh, for an RSS feed, which will take you straight to uh, Spotify. Um, the next question I have for you, oh, Nathy answered the same thing. Uh, podcasts will be on Spotify and YouTube and soon Apple Podcasts, and we're working on that right now. Okay, from Leon D'Souza, he wants to know, in your experience, what was the major resistance to implementing digital transformation? Oh, the biggest resistance? Lack of investment. Lack of investment. Uh, probably followed by uh, skill set, internal skill set. I'd say the top two would be the lack of investment um, and internal skill set. Those are the two the top majors. And and you know, look, and I think that it, it's up to you know, there's the folks that that say that that sign the the, the check, right? And then there's the rest of us that are actually doing the grunt work, the grunt work, um, you know, day-to-day -day grunt work. It is up to you to prove to those check signers why it is so important that you need change. You need, you need data. You need to prove to those individuals why it is uh, that, that, that you need this. Um, I think uh, lack of investment, definitely uh, the number one barrier in my experience. Right. Oh, okay. I'm trying to get over to the chat panel. And we have, Mark is asking, how do you sell the digital transformation effort to the senior management in terms <laughs> of cost and benefit? We all know this story, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back to my previous answer. I know, I, you know, it, it's hard, right? Because, um, you know, for those of us that are so passionate about it, there's a gut feeling and then there's data. 
you know, you, you've got to get in front of them with the right data, right, Mark? Um, you know, you can't, you can, you can go in front of, you know, folks all day long and say, but I know, I know, I have this feeling and I just know it's going to work. And that's great because you have the passion for it. But I, I think we, you know, you need to, you need to gather all the data that you possibly can to prove um, the risks and opportunities and, and, and the benefits and weigh them all together um, to really prove out uh, to senior leadership, um, you know, the, the, the benefits of, of the investment. Okay, and Yuri is giving us an interesting statement. Nowadays, digital technologies, optimization and data are taking a bigger position. What's the likelihood we have to transform how we see supply and demand planners responsibility? I mean, should we transform and become little data scientists? No, not at all. Um, I think that that you know, um, as companies start to implement more of this, you know, um, digital technology that's out there, um, you know, I mentioned this a little bit earlier in my pre in, in our discussion. Um, you know, it really allows us to um, have those folks focus on other things, such as kind of really reading that data um, and making making better, more informed business decisions, being more part of the decision making process with leadership. Um, and coming to, um, you know, coming to the table with, with more ideas, um, the ability to make decisions quicker and make more informed decisions. Um, it, it'll allow planners to really go out um, and, and evaluate what's going on and understanding what's going on in the market for us to talk to each other. Um, and, and so I don't see it as more of a, um, if I can recall the, the, the question, you know, um, but I don't see it as more that, you know, just turning into kind of data mining activities. I, I, I think it's more um, the evaluation of the data and making more informed and quicker business decisions and being part of that. That's great. We're going to take one more question. Um, and then because you still have a long list of questions, what we're going to do is we always get a, a, digital, a digital printout of those questions and we're going to pass those to you. So if you have, during the meeting, if you have more questions to ask Melissa, please feel free to put them in the chat panel. We will certainly pass them on to her and she'll get some responses back to you. Uh, talk a little, bit, a little bit about homework. How do we avoid falling back into old habits instead of transforming forward? I think that's a great final yeah. question. Yeah, that is a great, great question. Um, you know, I, I'll, I said it before and I'll say it again, we're, we're in this unprecedented time um, where we're dealing with this pandemic that none of us ever in a million years thought that we were ever going to have to deal with. Um, we can't forget, um, you've got to prepare for, you have to have a plan A, but you have to have a plan B and you have to have a plan C. Um, when things like this go awry, um, you, you, you just, you've got to have a plan in place. Um, and I think that that is something that a lot of organizations are probably now realizing, um, look, 20 years ago, right? Completely different situation, but a, a very unfortunate one, September 11th happened. That was another very tragic thing that occurred. There were things that happened with a lot of companies that where they had to have, um, you know, emergency plans in place. You learn, on, you know, from the situation, you learn from, you know, making mistakes, but you learn from things that happen to you in life, just in general. And I think that this is a big learning experience for us. Very different, obviously, than what happened before, but it is a, uh, it, it's something that we all just need to have better plans in place. It's, it's a company's obligation to do so. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Would you like to wrap up? Yeah, so um, I, First and foremost, Melissa, you've definitely brought um, a wealth of knowledge to the table. And I thank you so much for um, the time that you spent with us, the time that you spent talking about on digital transformation, answering all these questions. And I know that we have a lot more questions uh, that came in. And as Bernita uh, pointed to, those will get answered and um, we'll get those responses out to you. They'll, we'll have them posted for you. Um, on behalf of everybody on, on the board um, of ASCM, uh, thank you for joining us for a live episode of Supply Chain Briefs. Uh, please be on the lookout for our upcoming episodes. And you, like uh, Niti will me had mentioned, you can get it on Spotify, YouTube, soon to be um, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google, Google Play Store. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Um, but that, that wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you again, Melissa.
Thank you.